Hey everyone, welcome back to Software Testing and Quality Talks by Venkat Ramakrishnan. We have the honor of having with us today the father of DevOps, Patrick Debua. Of course, he needs no introduction, but let's give it a try. Patrick Debua is an industry known versatile technology leader helping companies adopt new technologies both organizational and engineering wise he coined the term devops by organizing the first devops days event and is the co-author of devops handbook currently he focuses on the intersection of devops and generative ai helping companies adopt this new form of automation intelligence with engineering rigor let's welcome patrick to our show Patrick, so to start off the discussion, I would like to talk about the GPTs. GPTs are text generators. While they can be used for that purpose, I see a lot of applications that is out of the text generation territory, like counting the letters in a word, knowing about the latest update on a hot news topic, etc. There, the GPTs fail miserably and leaves a bad taste in the mouth, mostly because of the way they generate text on their own accord, which is called hallucinations. Uh, I wouldn't use GPT for purposes outside its scope, would I? What is your opinion? Well, I think you're right in that it's it's not like a, a magic thing that will, you know, all of a sudden start reasoning or have certain things uh, like a calculator. That's the canonical example, right? It will kind of try to complete this as guessing with words, uh, but never do this exact. I think that's that's a view a lot of people have with the GPTs. The way I see this being complemented um, with uh, to get better results and less hallucinations is you start mixing the GPTs with a set of tools. So a tool could be a calculator. And then you ask, uh, for example, the GPT, here's a list of tools. Um, do I need to use a tool? And then it says, yes, I need a calculator. And then you, you hook it up to a more coding-centric uh, tool that understands uh, calculation. So that's kind of how I see people uh, mitigate the fact that it is indeed just text generation, but a text generation given a task and given a set of tools can generate the fact that it needs a tool and then you use an exact tool to compensate uh, what the LLM uh, or the GPT is not good at. Oh, that's pretty interesting. That's a new thought that I have heard. That's pretty useful. Thank you for that. Now, I guess uh, people get enamored by the ability of the GPTs to chat like humans, being polite, they apologize, etc. Most of the times the GPTs are able to provide information that is almost correct, which is good enough for many, but a few have looked at its uh, technical architecture, the way they work and the intent for which they have been built. Let's move on. Being a pioneer of the DevOps and now learning and talking about LLMs, what are your thoughts on how LLMs can contribute to the DevOps. There are murmurs about DevOps being dead, but still asking the question because who knows, it might help the platform engineering too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I guess that's two different conversations. Um, one about DevOps being dead. Um, yeah. That it, you have to see this as, well, the initial conflict was about a big group of devs against a big group of ops. And then we started about collaborating across organizational groups. Um, so that's kind of the higher level abstraction of this. Now in many companies, the organizational structure has changed to more of indeed feature teams for and platform teams and enabling teams. So that grouping has changed and you know people would typically place this under like platform engineering uh, as such. Now there's there's a couple of ways um, people see DevOps in, oh, it's just automation or we have a new term. And I, you know, I think that's all fine. It, it's a matter of evolution. But the holistic view of you optimize the whole of the process and not in your individual part is still predominant and alive. And I often give the example to 
uh, somebody working in a platform team, and they're, they're so proud about you know them working in Kubernetes, and I would call that engineering and in their work with this. And, and so I, I was asked them, so what what bro- gap have you tried to bridge in this? Like, did you actually talk to the people using your platform? Like, who do you do this for? Like, what's your next bottleneck you're going to solve? So kind of that holistic thinking, you can bring that into DevOps organizationally and technically. So that's kind of like one part of your question. Is it that? And once in Austin, I, I call it like, DevOps is like a meme, right? It will, it's like a cultural entity. It will resurface, go up and down. And that's all fine. You know, kind of, we had a similar thing with agile and, and, and past, um, mm-hmm. kind of like up and down things. So, you know, that, that's only normal. So is it evolving? I hope so very much that it's evolving. Uh, so, so that's a good thing. The second part is where does, uh, Gen AI uh, come in there. Where does um, Gen AI and DevOps intersect? In the past, there's been the interaction between AI and DevOps, and it had like two names. One was the AI ops, which was collecting information um, of production or events and logs and all things to predict predict uh, anomalies or changes or impacts. Then there was ML ops, which kind of resided a little bit outside of this realm, more in the data lens, and they kind of grown apart, but it could have been together as a way of delivering kind of uh, machine learning models. And now with Gen AI, um, there is a like multiple ways how the interaction goes. Like I have typically a narrative around Gen AI can help certain engineering practices, you know, mm-hmm. kind of like whether that's your code completion, whether that's like finding better documentation on your Kubernetes or, you know, it, it, like test data. There's a lot of things that it can be used for. And then the second thing is, um, while now a lot of the Gen AI proof of concepts have been delivered to our production, I think they could benefit from better delivery and engineering practices and collaboration um, as we did in DevOps. Some will call this uh, AI engineering as a term that <laughs> that's kind of like uh, uh, a little bit confusing, like every term, but that's kind of like what people are calling this. Uh, and they call about... Uh, their call to action is a shift uh, um, shift right in this case. So shift left was for security to get earlier in the value stream. Shift right for data was to get closer to production engineering and being used by customers. So there is an intersection of a collaboration of two silos through this new technology that is kind of emerging and better collaborating on on what they're doing. And then if you take that, the third one um, on organizational changes, that is where the, the, the company is building those applications. Maybe mm-hmm. they have a next step that it has a home in platform engineering uh, and also enablement on this new technology to all the engineering groups. So it's not just the data science that we are enabling in their own group. It will be all engineering feature teams that can use the new tooling uh, to, to uh, you know, parts in the product or functionality in the product. So that's kind of like another link uh, to DevOps and, and, and Gen AI. Uh, so initially, you could see this as a technology piece, much like serverless or mobile or internet. But we're also starting now seeing a little bit of a shift in the organization due to the new technology that is happening in kind of uh, organizations. So what kind of shift is it? Well, the shift is uh, one about the the data team and the production application team working closer together because it is not separated anymore. You need data to do a better uh, to get the data in your prom. So you cannot just have that into your data lake. So that's definitely one shift that I see happening. Um, and the other one is the engineering practices where a lot of people talk, for example, on um, uh, testing the model, uh, evaluating the model. They are now shifting also to production practices like, oh, you have to test the model and the prompt and the API. And there's versioning, there's proxies, there's a lot of infrastructure uh, that that is working um uh, in that capacity of integration as well. Um, so in a way, in many companies, the the data team was kind of in its own silo uh, as such. Wow, okay. 
Um, don't you think it's risky to test that in production as with any other software? Um, of course, it is risky, uh, but you can um, mitigate uh, risks by looking at your use case. So let's say, you know, people in the beginning said, oh, all this kind of automation from deploying service, um, you can bring down the whole infrastructure. Of course, you could do this, right? So it, it's a bad thing. But then we architected around this by having the monitoring, this fail safe checks and so on. So the same thing is now happening is you're not just having a prompt and a customer enter prompt first with the filtering of what the user can do. Then we do scrutiny on the output and we see, for example, we don't have it uh, just output text, but we put a filter, we put a check in place, whether it's not, does not have like PII or confidential information. So there's a lot more scrutiny uh, that we put in there as guardrails. And then not every case is about a complete uh, text in and text out um, in a way that it is um, automated. If there's still a human in the loop that checks the output and importantly is able to verify the output, maybe uh, with grounding it through uh, documents that have been written by humans that exist on your wiki uh, and not just by the LLM, that increases uh, and reduces, uh, sorry, increases the the quality and reduces the risk uh, and has guardrails. And then if you clearly show also that it's being generated and not, and it should be treated with caution, then you have another layer of warning their user that they have to do their own kind of uh, scrutiny on there. Uh, it's not just about the PII. It's also about prompts being used to deviate the model from its uh, optimal performance uh, something like poisoning and things like that, that we need to be careful about, which is another area of interest in security. I think... Uh, Correct, yeah. But that is uh, like like any good old security, there's input and output checking. And maybe you just uh, have kind of the right fields of input checking. And I understand that prompt injection has not been a solved problem, but there are models who kind of... Uh, give with a certain um, certainty whether this was a prompt injection, yes or no. So they've been trained like smaller models to verify that whether there was a prompt injection. And then uh, it's pretty much also like a WAF. They check what goes in and out. But again, the ultimate tester and validator is the human. Um, and you can just say if you're uncertain, you give, I don't know, and it was a bad answer. Uh, but if you're just letting it pass through, of course, bad things can happen as well. Interesting. So let's talk a bit about hallucinations. Uh, by now, mm -hmm. I think the industry has a thorough understanding of the types of hallucinations out there, but they remain mostly as metrics. Metrics by themselves do not solve problems. They are just indicators. I think we need to take the feedback loop and try to improve the models. But the core of how these models work is mostly out of the reach of the entrepreneurs and people who like to build on these basic models. Uh, tweaking mm -hmm. on the training data alone does not help. But uh, some mm -hmm. core transformations to the models are ne indeed needed, right? So what are your thoughts on hallucinations and how we can address them? So the... Um... The pattern that a lot of people have been using to reduce this, and I'm saying reduce, it's not like an absolute reduction, mm -hmm. um, is the concept of uh, retrieval augmented generation. And what you do there is you have the model on one hand, the LLM, and then you have a set of documentations, uh, you know, whether that's similar to Wikipedia, your internal wiki, or your like website that you know that are true. And one way of writing the prompt end is by saying, well, to answer these questions, here's a set of information that comes from the document I've given you and only answer the, give the answer based on what I've provided you. So mm. instead of making things up from the general internet, you ground it in the documents and only allow it to use the documents you provided. So that drastically reduces because if it, if it can't, answer it from those documents, uh, it would say, I'm not allowed to answer, or I don't know the answer. Uh, and this is also the, it has a, a few ex, uh, benefits. One is the hallucination reduction. Two, you can 
fetch those documents and those pieces of documents at runtime, which solves also your access problem in a way that only uh, you get answered by documents people are all, are allowed to see. Mm. So that's kind of like what people are using to improve this. Um, sometimes it's you can do other things like you can check the relevance of the answer. So there's helper models that allow you to check whether the question and the answer are related uh, and it kind of like um, make sure that, you know, there is a, there is a semantic uh, relationship between them. So it's not something you made up. And then the third, uh, like maybe the last thing uh, was that people are um, fine tuning their models, which is within the reach of, you know, every individual, you can do it on your laptop, uh, throw that data in on your own documents. It kind of, um, I don't know, I'm not a data scientist, but the day, way that it's explained, uh, it, it improves the almost like the lexicon of what the answer is. Mm -hmm. But when you still combine it with the RAG, so with grounded documents, then you even get uh, better results than just using the generic LLM. So that's kind of what I heard from you know people improving um in that way, the hallucinations and grounding this. Yeah, so the hallucinations is not just about getting the information from the generic internet, but it's also about the way the model works in generating the text based on mm -hmm. its own uh, uh, text generation capabilities. It can make up things that are not there, not even in the gen generic internet. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it could make up things which are factually wrong or which which might look good in terms of English language, but they are factually wrong. This can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, this yeah. is basically because of the way the model is built and its architecture, uh, because it's based on generative text. There are some guardrails that we can put in place to prevent this uh, from happening, like attention masking. But um, I guess it's how much we implement those things in the models, even though the benchmarks are improving release by release, I think we are still facing issues with the accuracy of the answers and, yeah. the, and the factual. But it is vastly reduced when you use the RAG because then you say only use this information to answer. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it uses the, let's say, the generic capabilities of the LLM but it is, for lack of a better term, forcing it to only use the facts that you've stated in your right. own documents. Okay. And okay. that reduces this in that way. Wonderful. I think that's a very good yeah. input. I see that you are doing a lot of talks in conferences these days. And what are the topics that you talk about mostly? And what are the topics that you would recommend in general for the software testing and quality folks? Yeah, so... um like I mentioned before, I have the two narratives, one on delivering Gen AI applications, um, where I try to explain people that it, you don't need to be a data scientist to build this kind of applications, but you understand the rigor of bringing these things into production. Um, and the second one is more how it's changing our own field. So on, on the first thing uh, for QA and testing, there is, uh, for some reason, when there's a new technology, uh, the first phase is always getting into work. And yes, uh, you know, we're happy. Finally, you know, it works for a use case. Usually what comes after that is that people are thinking about automating the testing because a lot of the cases I hear from companies and ask them, how do you do testing? Oh, we still do this manually. Like, you know, that cannot scale uh, because that is just anecdotal uh, verification of your work in Application land, we uh, you would often hear about evaluations, uh, a set of input and output pairs that can be checked uh, and run through uh, the model. So, for example, I, I ask it a question about what is the capital of a certain country, and I know the answer is like this. Um, so instead of asking it to just a model, I run it through my prompt, my application, uh, and the whole thing, and I have this kind of input-output verification to see if that's correct um, in a way. Uh, and I can build up that test set similar to the test that set that was used for training, but I can build like a verification test set to see if my application is giving the right results. Now, 
there's a couple of things that is different than traditional testing. Uh, an exact test, that's easy. I want to check that the text that is being generated has like 15 lines. That's an easy check. You know, kind of like count lines and that's that. You can do a regex. Does it contain a certain word? Okay, you know, that's that's a familiar test. But then doing things like, okay, was this answer uh, optimistic? Was it toxic? Uh, was it relevant? For that, people are using helper smaller models, so not lar uh, language models, but kind of like a traditionally trained models. They kind of give a certain degree of uh, confidence that it was toxic or non-toxic. And, and so this is like one way uh, that the testing is changing, that you're using kind of helper models for this. Now, you don't have a helper model for every quality metric there. Imagine that I, I make something up and it is generating, uh, I know, the, the best soccer team in the world. I don't have like uh, something that is uh, trained on this or I might not have that, enough data. So what mm -hmm. is the other route that people are doing is they're basically asking an other LLM. What do you think about the answer? <laughs> and then they, they kind of, uh, that is called like LLM as a judge in a way. So that's kind of another uh, way that they're deal people are dealing with this like uh, non-deterministic generation uh, and helping. Is this perfect? Obviously not. But if you run this to your test set and you tune your prompt or you change your prompt, uh, you do some of your data uh, changes, you can see your test set and your validation improving. And then the bonus is when you have that test set, you can actually also use this input and output validation for your production monitoring, much like you would do a health check. Uh, this would be almost like your health check on, uh, on the data input and output validation. And then in production, you capture the feedback, whether that was a good answer whether it was validated. So people are using the same techniques, a helper model, an LLM judge in production to provide the quality metrics of what goes on into production. But the first thing is obviously the test sets, the validation, running this locally, and then you can reuse this into your observability tools and your monitoring tools. Cool. And you know that pretty much there are so many use cases that uh, we can think about. Uh, but what kind of future technologies that you think that you foresee from uh, foresee happening with uh, AI? Just uh, yeah. just just a brief update on that would be helpful. So there's there's a few let's say trends, and and I'm not close to all the source of the the new things. But um, one thing that is definitely picking up besides the evaluations and the testing is uh, the use of the concept of agents uh, and the the benefit it has is, you know, you, you can put into a prompt, you're like an expert in, you know, Kubernetes, you're an expert in .NET and so on. So what they do is they create multiple of these agents and ha they have uh, each other judge the output of the other. And by it's almost like you can create a team of people looking at the same output and then having a discussion and then a final decider agent. Mm -hmm. This has proven to improve a lot of the GPT quality. So GPT 3.5 with agents is on par with GPT 4. So this is something that a lot of people are looking at, uh, you know, as an agentic approach to give results. Uh, it's not the same, but sometimes you will hear the, the terminology, a mixture of experts. So you can kind of find this consensus of multiple people uh, looking at the same answer. So that's definitely something happening. And then you will see also maybe smaller models, more focused models uh, that are derived from the large um, language models uh, for specific tasks. Uh, so I think that's that's another trend um, that you know is is coming up. Um, and then there's like people trying to get all your context, whether that's your data, whether that's you working on your laptop, whether that's you talking to your colleagues. Um, I'm a bit skeptic on that one because of the privacy, but it is definitely a trend. People are trying to capture so much context uh, because they believe the more context we have, the better the results uh, will be. Um, but yeah, you know, we still have to see where we allow this to happen. Uh, recently, Microsoft um, launched a product called Recall, yeah, which is basically watching everything you're on your laptop. Yeah, uh, but you can imagine all the privacy issues and. 
their answer was, well, you know, buy our special laptop from us that has local in inference of the model, so it doesn't leave uh, kind of the network. Whether we're gonna buy this <laughs> or not, <laughs> that depends. But you can see kind of all the things, uh, something to wear. Uh, I, I got a graphic somewhere uh, where it is about like, you know, your glasses, uh, your running shoes, uh, your arm, like everything has some kind of context uh, and creation. Uh, and big companies are trying to capture everything in there. But uh, again, that is maybe a lot more far-fetched, but you can see it doesn't stop at the LLM and the prompt generation. It does not stop at the code completion. Now you're uh, doing code completion on the whole repo and then they can see the whole network. And so that's kind of uh, something that will just continue. Is, uh, uh, and it's, it's one of those things I notice uh, people, uh, what it often boils down to, if, if there's a problem with AI or AI is not good, good enough, we feed it more data and we use more AI to solve the problem, <laughs> which I don't know where we're going to end, but it, it seems that like a lot of the belief is, is going that way. Uh, but that might also lead to the downfall eventually. So, but uh, it's right. interesting to see how far we can stretch this. Interesting and scary. Um, yeah, indeed. We are coming to the end of the discussion and uh, trying to get to know you better. Uh, what are your hobbies and interests apart from work? What do you do in your free time? Oh, I was going to say computers, but that sounds very nerdy, right? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I, I like to learn new things. So I read, I read a lot of books uh, on, um, you know, society impact or kind of uh, those things. And the other thing I do a lot is I watch a lot of movies and television series. Uh, yes, I watch them at double speed, uh, but I'm oh. always interested in a, in, a, in a good story. I know it's blasphemy, but I, I like new twists. I like new kind of variations on the same thing. So uh, that's definitely uh, something I do. And uh, maybe as a final thing, I have um, a very uh, strange thing that I like all the talent shows. Like it doesn't matter what, uh, like that that first glance of somebody being discovered, their new skill showing off, being insanely good. I, I really like that uh, as something. Yeah. yeah, and I guess you do a lot of travel in uh, within Europe, I guess, and also to the US. Yeah, it it has picked up again. Uh, you know, a lot of people want to hear about AI and DevOps, so that helps. But it's it's also nice that we can do it again after the pandemic and uh, see a lot of people. So uh, it's always nice to meet uh, people if you work remotely as well. Yeah, wonderful. So thanks a lot for your inputs and spending time today with us for the software testing and quality talks. I hope the viewers enjoy your point of views and uh, they can actively use them in their day-to-day -day work. So I would strongly recommend them to connect with you on LinkedIn and other means available so that they can be in touch with you and get to know you better and your work. Thanks a lot for the time again and have a nice day and have a nice time, Patrick. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me and asking me all the hard questions on Twitter <laughs> but, yeah, you know, throughout an ID. I really appreciate that, that you make me think. So thanks for that. Okay, great. Thank you.